Right. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome back to our final event in this online learning series for the East African Community Region on Communities Combating Illegal Wildlife Trade. And thank you for joining us today. So one final reminder that these events are supported by USAID Kenya and East Africa through the Conserving Natural Capital and Enhancing Collaborative Management of Transboundary Resources, or CONNECT project, and the European Union through their BioParma program. And this series of events has been focused on the EAC region and has been designed to support wildlife conservation and management authorities in the EAC partner states, as well as relevant NGOs and community-based organizations of the region. So today is our final online learning event, um, and we are going to be focusing on the future of flood. So I'm now going to hand over to Diane, who's going to start taking us through some highlights from the series. Okay, thanks very much, Liv. Let me just put this onto um, screen share. So um, welcome. I hope everyone is still got some energy um, at the end of the year, even though things are winding down. Um, we've really enjoyed uh, sharing Flood with you over the last six um, webinars, learning, learning events. Um, I'm going to be running through um, some key messages and highlights from the overall series. And we are then um, going to quickly run through highlights um, from the overall methodology. So Holly and I will be taking you through each step of the methodology quite quickly, um, just as a reminder of what we've done over the last few sessions before we move on to um, other applications and the future of flood. So a reminder of what we call Spaghetti Junction, which is really our um, graphical representation of how the methodology works and the various uh, steps that, that you go through um, in order to uh, use the flood approach from beginning to end. Um, and just, just quickly, a few things to say in, in, a, in a sort of high level um, approach um, on, on flood about what it is and importantly what it is not because you know this is not a panacea for all situations it's not something that could or should be used in all um, contexts so just a quick overview of those um, we've hit on them through each of the sessions but just to summarize so the flood approach is a very um, structured step-by-step -step, um, and iterative approach that helps you to articulate and test assumptions of different groups of stakeholders. In this case, because we're working with existing projects, um, we're looking at the assumptions of communities and implementers of those projects on the ways that they believe um, community engagement can help to combat illegal wildlife trade. Um, the flood approach is a methodology that can improve project outcomes and interventions. It's an open source methodology that practitioners can use. Um, it's a tool that helps to articulate logic and underlying assumptions in a project to identify what's working, but also to identify potential flaws in the logic, which might help uh, to identify places where a project might not be working. What it is not, it is not something that is for every place and for every situation. And that's really important. So. This is not something that we believe should or could be used in all situations and all contexts, as we'll go through in the next highlights um, part of the presentation. Um, you know, the, there's a real process of feasibility to assess whether it's right for a particular situation. It's not a blueprint, blueprint for interventional project design. Um, and I think very importantly, it's not an evaluative um, methodology. This is not something that's going to assess or evaluate um, in, in the way that we understand those words uh, for, for project performance or achievement. Um, it's not a checklist and it's definitely not something for beginner practitioners. This is something that 
you know, more experienced um, practitioners uh, would, would find beneficial. It would be challenging for beginner practitioners. Um, it's, a, it's an approach that can help to um, explore site-specific drivers of the illegal wildlife trade. It can shed light on which community-based strategies are likely to be most effective in a particular place. Um, it can help to enhance achievement um, in a project. It can help donors to analyze and improve effectiveness of investments. Um, it can provide lessons for other projects um, being designed as well as lessons to enhance the response to the illegal wildlife trade at various scales. Um, the core of the methodology, the approach is what we call this basic equation. Um, essentially, the benefits from conserving wildlife minus the costs of conserving wildlife need, so the net benefits of conserving, need to be greater than the benefits from engaging in illegal wildlife trade minus the costs of engaging in the illegal wildlife trade. So those net benefits of conserving need to be greater than the net benefits of poaching. And that is really at the core of the flood approach is this basic equation. And that equation translates into something that I hope you're now much more familiar with than you were at the beginning, which is what we call the baseline TOC. And we'll go through this uh, a few more times today, but the baseline TOC is the core of the flood approach. Um, I am going to quickly, uh, I still have a few minutes, go through the highlights from the first of our substantive methodology sessions, so session three. And this session focused on two steps of the methodology, your screening and scoping and your inception workshop. So during the screening and scoping, it's very important to define the community, the locality, identify the place, the people, and gather context on, on the particular situation that is gonna be the focus of the flood approach. Um, during this part of the methodology, uh, it's very important to assess feasibility. And the methodology provides site-based criteria and process-based criteria. And again, this is where um, you, you can really figure out whether the flood approach is appropriate for a particular context. In the scoping um, part of the, of the, of the process, uh, this involves work with both the implemented designers and the communities to understand the situation and to expose them to the flood approach. Um, so this we, we highlighted as an exercise that you can do in a very participatory manner with the community to understand which species um, are in use in a particular area. Um, as I said, you want to work to expose uh, the various stakeholders to the different um, pathways and to the overall flood approach and the TOC. And particularly, you want to start exposing people to the idea of assumptions. So the um, assumptions that underpin the causal logic of the TOC. And, and just to highlight that again, the TOC has interventions, outputs, uh, outcomes, and an overall impact. And at each step, moving from one level to the next are assumptions. So these are some of the messages that need to be um, starting to come out in that scoping phase. Um, this is just an example of a single pathway. Um, in the scoping, you also work to um, get an initial idea with the community as to which of those four pathways they feel is most important in combating illegal wildlife trade. Um, and so, you know, we, we outlined a methodology to um, do an initial pathway ranking during the scoping phase. Um, so I will now hand over to Holly, who will give um, the next few um, pieces of highlights. Thanks, Holly. Good morning, everyone. Um, great to see so many of you with us still in our last session here uh, of this learning series. So I'm now going to pick up from where Diane left off and start 
to go through uh, basically our highlights from session four and session five. So those of you that have been with us will remember that session four, we focused very much on how we go about creating that implementer designer theory of change and what the steps are that are involved in that. Of course, we again went back to the, uh, the basic baseline theory of change, which is the basis with which we then use to create that implementer designer theory of change by querying their own thoughts against ours. And we very, very directly showed you how we would do that by working through with those implementer designers pathway by pathway uh, their logic from the intervention level to the output level to the pathway outcomes, the interim outcomes, final outcomes, and up to impact, and the assumptions that filled in at each of those levels. So what were they having to assume would be necessary to make those interventions succeed at giving outputs, uh, the outputs succeed at giving outcomes, and the outcomes succeed at the final impact. So most of you will remember that this is the, the flow. And the session worked on how do we do that? How do we get from that baseline to that implementer theory of change? And what is the process? So how did we go through the interviews? How did we do the querying? And how did we then create that next implementer theory of change, which is the fundamental basis for our next step? So we talked about who was necessary to have in the room, the flood team, the team of implementer designers, and why it was important for those different players and how to decide who was going to be there at that session. We told you um, about the tools that are used when we're doing this work with the implementer designers. So obviously we use our baseline theory of change and we began to introduce our spreadsheet tool, which we call our development tool, and you all have access to where we begin to query them on the individual statements that take you from your intervention logic through your assumptions to get to your final impacts. And we showed you how we generally use a series of statements. So we read out a statement and then we ask the implementer designers whether they agree or strongly agree, whether they disagree or st strongly disagree. And we showed you that sometimes we use prompts to do that because it helps people to work very well together in groups. So we also then come up with this sort of way of moving from the use of these tools with the flood team helping to work through that. And the tool, the, the development tool, then giving you pathway by pathway, the basic scoring that has been done by the implementer designers that allow the team then to work on presenting back to them that entire uh, theory of change that they have developed. And of course, we then have the very necessary step of validating that. So whereas the flood team goes away having listened and done the interrogating and gone through using the tools, we then come together again with the implementer designers to make sure that we have got things right. And if we don't have things right, that we make sure to change them before finalizing that and agreeing together that the whole implementer designer theory of change is stable and that it is ready for the next step. So a key part which we bring up here, just so we don't forget it is, that along the line, we mentioned to you that there's going to be need for you to be doing these key stakeholder interviews. And of course, that at the beginning, um, you pick up on uh, who is needed for that. And you use your implementer designers and your, and your community liaison to decide what kind of information you're going to need to be getting and to be looking at um, all of these three ways of getting it. So you need people that have knowledge, people that have authority and people that have influence. And of course that is necessary at the, your most local level 
at your regional level. And in this sense, we mean regional within the country. So it may be a district, it may be a province, it may be a region, and then those players that are at your national level. And so all along, you're going to be doing these key stakeholder interviews as and when you can. So some of them will be done in the field, some of them will be done in the capital city, some of them will have to be done uh, remotely. And of course, COVID will have changed that for all of us. So let me now come on to the highlights from session five. And those are the, the steps that are involving both those key stakeholder interviews that I just captured for you. So now you'll be actually doing the key stakeholder interviews. And this is where we're going to do our community field work and um, construct our community theory of change. So we're using that piece that we now have, the implementer theory of change here, to take us through these steps to get to our community theory of change. So starting with our implementer theory of change, we showed you how we use that to get from one step to the next. And again, the process that takes you from one to the next. And we know and remember that the community theory of change is a good bit more complicated because it involves us exploring these pathways and their assumptions with different focus groups. And as you may remember, those focus groups will be defined early on in your process at your inception workshop, because it may be men and women in different groups. It may be, um, you may have youth groups, they may be separated into male and female. That's all decided at the very beginning. So now when we're with the community, we begin working independently with each of the focus groups. And that takes quite some time. So just to remember that, for example, we might be working on with the, the youth on pathway B. We again work through every one of the four pathways with each of them. But we saw how the youth then bring out their own views about the tangible and intangible benefits to be had in pathway B. And our star diagram shows us then at one quick step, each of the assumption statements that we've worked on and whether the assembled group agrees or disagrees with them. So this big empty space showing the disagreement, this big full space showing the strong agreements. We then of course do our iterative validation and this is absolutely key that you always check back with your focus group while you're still in the focus group. You're playing all of this back to them so that you make sure that you heard everything as clearly as possible and that your assembled group agrees with you that you got it right while you're there. Of course, there's the next step in, in the bigger validation, but this is really, really key. And um, what we can tell you is as a flood team, you'll be working incredibly hard over these days that you're inter interacting and engaging with the community. We then, in each focus group, we you'll remember that we went through this fun pathway ranking exercise where we let each of the focus groups tell us, well, what did they think, you know, in terms of if they were asked which are the interventions and which pathway is the most important for achieving our impact, how would you how would you score them? And you see, we've got the, the men, the women and the youth, they all said different things there. And that leads us then on to our whole community meeting where we bring absolutely everyone together to begin to look at what was said at each of the different levels. And that community workshop is really important because you have to bring people together to see where their similarities and differences are. One really key message to remember is in that whole community exercise, you want everyone there to have been involved in a focus group meeting. So you can't start having people that don't represent the community that haven't been brought in earlier on because it will create a lot of confusion. So this is all going to be people that have been involved in the process from their start. And again, we go back and we will bring as a team you will be bringing together the areas to show them on each of these different um, statements where, the, where they had their strong agreements and disagreements, and then bring that together for them as a group to show them all together, well, this is what 
the women thought, and this is what the men thought, that seemed more similar, but actually the youth had a very, very different view on this particular statement that legal wildlife markets exist. So you'll remember that this is how we brought them together to think about these things. And then we had them go back, they go into their individual focus groups once again, and they talk about all those similarities and differences. And then they feed back again some of their thoughts to the overall group assembled, and then break out again into groups that are mixed between the different focus groups. And that's, as I think we covered in that session, such a fun time. And this whole meeting is generally very, very exciting and very full of energy. So we end this by showing them the different rankings done across the different uh, focus groups. How did they rank the pathways? So they can see, for example, something very different in pathway C, something that all three groups were very, very similar on pathway B. And it allows them to understand. And then we end that session with um, a whole group activity where as a group, they, they stand around together. Uh, you could do this anyway. You can do it under a tree. You can do it wherever you are and have them jointly now do a pathway ranking exercise together. And I think you'll find that if you just leave them to the exercise, stand back and let them do it together, you'll see some really wonderful, wonderful interactions. So that takes us up through path through uh, session five. And um, I go back to Diane to pick up again on session six. Okay. Um, right, so session six, um, this is last week, uh, two weeks ago. Um, and this covered the last three steps in the methodology. Um, it covered the feedback workshop, communicating lessons learned, and monitoring and adapting. So a very important uh, stage, Holly just talked about um, during the implementer designer process, uh, the step in which you validate the implementer designer TOC. You need to do the same thing with the community TOC. Um, this would usually take place at the feedback workshop because there's a lot of information that you gather during the community um, field work. And so you need to go away as a flood team and really integrate work through all of that information in order to develop the community TOC. So your next opportunity to interact with the community would be at the feedback workshop. And again, you want to make sure that you've got people represented from the focus groups all the way through the whole community meeting and into the feedback workshop um, so that it's some of the same individuals. Um, and you would do the same, same process. Have we got the story right? Has anything changed since our visit? Is it right? If it's not right, working with those community members to figure out uh, what needs to change so that the community TOC represents um, the, the, the thoughts and the opinions of the community. Um, you would then uh, bring the implementer designers and the community together in the feedback, feedback workshop um, and undergo a process of identifying and discussing key differences and similarities between uh, the, the two TOCs. So places where things are very similar, places where there are dramatic differences um, you would want to work through those in quite a detailed way. Um, and again, the methodology provides you with some tools and approaches for doing that. Um, with all of that information, you would then facilitate a discussion to explore those differences and similarities and see if there are ways forward uh, to make adjustments within the project. So at a minimum, this would involve the community, the flood team, and the implemented designer, but it would also um, be very beneficial to have other stakeholders such as policy influencers, government agencies, tourism operators, um, private sector um, interests in the area, as well as, of course, any current or potential donors. 
um, because you may need to go to them to ask for adjustments in budget, um, to fund new projects, um, new interventions that have been identified through this process. Uh, the, we then move on to step six, which is communicating the lessons learned. Um, the methodology doesn't provide huge detail on this because it's incredibly dependent on the objectives of your implementation of flood. So, you know, you may um, be an academic uh, 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 institution. And so what you really want out of this is a journal article. That's quite different from, um, you know, a, a revised project implementation plan um, as, a, you know, something that, that can just help improve the project. Um, policy briefs, if, if influencing policy at, at national or international level is part of your um, objectives, um, case studies, fact sheets, um, or even just a, a, you know, quite practical resource for the community and the implementers, designer, implementers designers as they move forward. Um, we do really encourage you, if you do um, do this work, or even if you already have a project um, that hasn't been through the flood process, but is about engaging communities in combating the illegal wildlife trade, we do really encourage you to submit a case study to the People Not Poaching Forum. Um, and of course, go, go there and explore other projects. There's a lot of rich information there. Um, and I, Liv talked through um, how, how you can go about that. Um, we then talked about what happens next. So, so, so the so what, um, and, we, and we went through um, what we consider to be uh, the transfer of ownership. So, you know, the flood team is sort of shepherding the community and the implementer designers through this process. But um, as, as the individual TOCs are developed, and then as those are brought together in the feedback workshop, uh, the intention is that this ownership shifts from the flood team to the stakeholders on the ground, and that they are able to then implement adaptive management based on what has been learned um, through the process. So that was session six, um, but I'll pause here to ask if there are any questions or comments. I don't know, Liv or Holly, if we've got any that have come in through the um, chat, probably not. We're rushing through quite a lot of information here. Uh, nothing, nothing so far, just people uh, needing to know where they're going to be finding all of this. And uh, we're going to have the links at the end of the talk today. And all of you should be able to find the recordings will have been sent to you by Grace Miano from IUCN. Yeah, and they are also all on the People Not Poaching website. So again, we will share those links um, in the chat at the end of the at the end of today's session. Okay, so I think we're, we're on time. So I'll pass back on to Holly, who's going to take us um, into what next for, for, for or different approaches and what next. Okay, so um, apologies to all that we raced through. Uh, but in a way, we felt we needed to uh, really cover everything that we've done so far. Uh, but we wanted to do that to put you sort of in a the mood for one of the things that we know people have been asking, which is remembering that everything we've talked about in the session to date has been about existing projects, places where there's already some implementer designer on the ground or a donor working with a community. And many of you have been asking us, but what about when we want to design a new project? Is flood something that we can use for that? So we're going to just give you some very basics on on that um, to begin with, so that so that you can get an idea of of how to do this. So of course we start with that baseline uh, to develop the implementer designer, and then to compare that implementer designer to get our community theory of change, and that's that's really ultimately what we've been trying to get at. But how do you do that? when you're starting from scratch. So obviously it needs to be done in a slightly different way. So we've had long discussions about this and we feel pretty strongly that our baseline theory of change, if you're dealing in an illegal wildlife trade project is a very strong starting place. 
you may need to do some re some revision of it, but it would be a starting place for any new project. Now they're gonna there's this is going to be a bit different, and you'll see that it does not work in the same linear way that you would have been doing it with an existing project. So actually, you're gonna have to be doing two pieces at the same time, and I'll put them up so you can see. So on the one hand, you would be working with the community, and of course is the critical part of this is that the reason you can't come together and do it together right from the start is that it's very important to hear the different voices in the community, whether that's the men, the women, the young men, the young women, however that's combined or separated, they need to have a chance to have a voice. Because what can often happen is, if you were to just go to a single workshop right from the beginning, and say, let's just develop it together, you're going to get some very dominant voices from the community side. And in fact, if you do a single workshop, they may not even decide to invite young women. They may not decide that it's necessary to have any women. They may say, why young men? They don't need to be there. So it's very important that they have an opportunity to reflect on this baseline theory of change themselves. So they will not be looking at your partner theory of change. Now you're, I've changed that, as you can see, to partner rather than implementer designer, because you're, doing, you're going to be doing this together. But it has to take a first step. And each of you will use the baseline theory of change. So previously, you'll remember that it was linear. We took this implementer designer theory of change, developed it, and then we went to the community. This time, you'll be going to the community and to the partner at the same time. Then, after they have had the opportunity to work in their own way against the baseline theory of change, they'll be brought back together. And then you begin the real work of your joint TOC. And we could give you the steps in that. You can design the steps in that. But what's really critical here is to know that it is going through a different process. So whereas, I'll just repeat that, whereas you would have previously said theory of change, baseline theory of change to the implementer, designer, partner, and then to the community, and then get together jointly, this is different. This is going to be baseline to community, baseline to partner, and then partner and community coming together to really nail down their joint theory of change. So that's the process for doing it, doing a new project on illegal wildlife trade. And it is just slightly different, but you have all the tools will be the same to be able to use them at each of those steps. Now, others among you wanted to know, how would we use flood for different challenges? If we're not dealing on illegal wildlife trade, would flood be useful for other challenges? And some of you that have been with us from the start will even remember this was a, one, of our, one of our mentee exercises where we said, what else do you think the flood theory of change methodology might be useful for? And we came up together with a bunch of different thoughts, but today Diane and I decided, well, let's try and work something through to show you how that might go. So we chose looking at the different things that you had given us as possibilities. And what we chose was another example. So if you wanted to use the flood methodology for this particular example, to make all use of natural resources, whether it's legal or illegal, whether it's subsistence or commercial, sustainable. So you want to make all use of natural resources sustainable. And that's going to be basically your impact statement. So as we talked about it, we looked back on our basic equation and we thought, okay, pretty good. It still holds. You can change it very moderately and say that the benefits from managing natural resources minus the costs of managing those resources, so your net benefits of managing natural resources, will exceed the benefits from unsustainable natural resource use minus 
the costs of engaging in unsustainable natural resource use, remembering that there could be all kinds of costs of management and there could be all kinds of costs involved in unsustainable use, particularly if it's illegal. And that that then means that your benefits from stewarding and managing those natural resources properly have to be greater than your benefits of continuing to use things unsustainably. And this is a very, as we went through this, we saw this is quite an interesting question for many, many places in Africa where we're working, which is that there's still more benefit coming from unsustainable use. And that's why uh, we're driving a lot of natural resources really into the ground. So this is important. The equation still holds. And that took us on to, okay, so how did Diane and I go about developing a project together where we want to develop our theory of change and then put together a project that's going to do that. So we worked in this, in this way. Holly developed a theory of change and Diane developed a theory of change. And then we began to talk about the similarities and differences that we had. And we didn't go through the whole exercise though we easily could have um, because we didn't wanna preempt any discussion here but then we would get together to do that. So, so this is how we started out. We, we both went to the baseline theory of change, but we replaced that top impact statement. That's always where you start. So we kind of erased everything and we said, okay, what would we want to put in here? And is there anything we want to keep? So we acted as if we had that baseline theory of change that we've been talking about all along for this training. And we looked at, are there things we wanna change? And we each did this independently. So I'll just run through quickly some of mine and then I'm gonna hand over to Diane and she'll run, over, run through some of hers. So when I looked at that statement, I thought, hmm, I think I need to change just some wording in pathway A. So I changed that to increase the cost of unsustainable use of natural resources. And then I looked at the different activities and in pathway A, I thought to myself, well, how about compiling information on any social sanctions or taboos on key species in use? If I then, if I did that activity, then I would think, okay, if the community then knows about that, it may increase their cost of, of that use. In other words, if they were gonna get sanctioned by their elders, they might not want to do that illegal or unsustainable use. And then I thought about, uh-huh, in pathway B, is there anything that I wanted to change there? And I thought, well, yeah, I, I wanted that outcome at that pathway level to change, to be communities make the link between sustainable use and long-term benefits. And if you were to go back to our baseline theory of change, you'd see that I've changed that language there from what it previously said. And, and I even did some changes up here in these higher level cross-cutting outcomes and overall outcomes. And lastly, I went into pathway D and I thought pathway D needs to, needs to have a change in there. So you can see that I changed everything here in pathway D, but just to point out that at the pathway outcome level, I also made a change. So all things were changing in pathway D and all assumptions behind that were changing. And then lastly, I also made a change down here in our, um, in our enabling actions. I changed the wording here of this particular enabling action, which was very focused on illegal wildlife trade. And I thought there's really a benefit to development and um, of policy and institutional frameworks. But before it said legal, so I felt like, well, on, on unsustainable or sustainable natural resources, we might need more policy. We might not be already at the legal level. And I thought that policy really needed to drive at devolving user rights. So that's where I made a change. And this was just through a fast way through. And, uh, and, and we didn't you know, spend hours and hours on this, but we did do it independently of one another. So I'll turn over to Diane. Yeah, so I, I also did the same um, process. Um, 
I, I looked at what what existed in the existing baseline and thought that it was you know, the, the IWT baseline and thought that it was pretty comprehensive. So I took a slightly different approach. Um, but we'll be we'll be talking you through a different way of doing this all together. But this is just one way. Um, Again, I changed the, uh, the pathway heading um, I, I, of pathway A. Um, and under pathway A, I also um, put a, a new intervention around putting in place community monitoring systems to track illegal or unsustainable use. Um, and then under, the, under pathway B, um, which had previously just been about communities being empowered to manage and benefit from wildlife, specifically made that about sustainable use of wild plants and animals. Um, I also, it's funny, Holly and I often have mind melds um, and, and we've done the same here, um, where I felt that the first enabling action needed some, um, you know, needed some adjustment. So it's not just about protection and management, but about benefits. Those um, policy and institutional frameworks for benefits. Um, so, so those were some of the changes that I made. Um, Holly, there's been a question in the, um, I think it's important to take it now. There's been a question about, um, would you need to, in a joint TOC, uh, negotiate the same long-term impact statement? Um, and I and I think that that's really important that yes, you would. So. Yes, yeah, I mean, definite, definitely you would. And as we're gonna show you, the impact statement is really where it all begins. Yeah. So even in this exercise, before Diane and I set off independently, we agreed that statement. So yeah. we previously agreed, let's, let's work on an example that's about make all use of wildlife sustainable. So the answer to your question is definitely. And if you need to renegotiate any of these things, you'll be doing that in that joint exercise. So Diane and I then, as the two players, would come back together again, and we would say, well, that's really weird. So, so you, you thought that this was a different outcome than I thought it was. So now we have to talk about this. Or your logic here was very different. And it really starts down here at the bottom, right? With these interventions. And we're gonna come on to these actions and talk about them and let you do some thinking around that as well. Because we just think that the best way to learn these things is, is to do them. So um, Diane, any other questions that pertain directly? I can go um, into that. No, I mean, there was a question questions. from Michael around the baseline. Um, TOC, how that gets developed. And I think that was a question about IWT projects with flood. So I, I answered in the chat, but um, this, the baseline that we use has been developed through quite a long process of, of examining projects that um, engage communities in combating illegal wildlife trade. So we believe it's quite robust. Um, it's an existing resource for you to use. Um, so you could take the baseline that exists to start your project, whether that's designing a new project or using flood for existing projects, you might wanna look at that baseline and say, gosh, there's something really missing for the context in which we work and make some adjustments. But in general, the baseline is, is an already existing resource. You wouldn't have to create it um, to start flood. Yeah. And, and I think you'll find uh, from, even from this small exercise that we're going to do that you'll be seeing quite early on whether you need to make adjustments. We, we think it's quite robust, but in a new area, if you're working in something totally different, I believe, and, and maybe our colleague is even on this call early on, uh, it was mentioned that the flood framework could work very, very effectively for climate adaptation projects. Right. And we tend to agree with that. Um, but you might find it's the case that there's a path, an additional pathway that you need. And no one should feel constrained by what, but by what's here. It has to work for you. We yeah, just feel you, quite yeah, confident I mean, you, that it works for illegal wildlife trade. Right. I mean, you might end up dropping the, the human wildlife conflict pathway. 
in right. a climate project. You, you, you know, you don't know. Um, another question from Alna, I think, I think it's good to take this now while we're in, in this sure. discussion is if um, the negotiation is accepted for the long-term impact, um, the assumption is that the enabling actions will be the same if the implementers are different. Not quite sure I understand the question. The, um, I think what we're assuming here that the implementers, I, we're not sure whether you mean there are different players implementing the project. We assume that there is a set of players implementing the project. And, and they may be multiple, they may be from multiple organizations, but they'd all be working towards the same end. But Elna, please feel free in the chat to, to give us more, more clarity if we haven't understood what you're after, if there is a set of players. Yeah, so, so if there's a set of players, you would want to, I, I think I know what you're getting at now. So if you had, let's just say, um, you were working in a national park setting and you had a number of different players. So you had the park authority and you had the, an NGO and you had um, the communities and you were all trying to do something together. You would have to expand out what we have here, right? So you would need to say, okay, everyone should get, get an agreement on what is the long-term impact, that's for sure. And then you would have to say, okay, each of you goes and does your development and then we pull it all together. So you could definitely have more players. We just gave you a very simplified um, way of looking at it with two players, but of course, life is more complicated and you may have more. Yeah, and also to say that the enabling actions are, um are part of the TOC. So they're up for changing and debate. And, you know, there may be very different opinions on what those underlying enabling actions need to be. Right, so I'm gonna close my chat again and, um, and move on. And we'll have a, a time at the very end of the session for, for any questions. Um, but we also, want to make sure that we have a bit of time to do the exercise that, that we have planned for you. So here we go with um, sitting down together. So, so we now know that we're pulling this together, right? From the communities, let's say, have been working on it. The partners have been working on it. And we're now coming together in that, in that joint, um, that, that joint, theory of change. And that's where we're all going to work from ultimately. So you do end up with something that you have all signed up to. And that that's the final piece of that. So on the mural exercise, we want to do something fun today. And we're going to be using mural. For those of you that haven't been with us before on mural, don't, don't panic. We're going to be giving explanation again about how to participate with us. But before we get onto the mural board, which is the place that we go and work, we want you to just take five minutes and we want you to think about this impact statement. Make all use of wildlife, whether it's legal or illegal, sustainable. So that is, we're just taking that as our accepted, all of us that are on the call. So I want everyone to participate in this, whether you're on the IUCN staff, whether you think you're just sitting by, whether you haven't been participating up until now, this is for everyone just to have some fun and see how we go about doing this. So think about this impact statement and remember back to the four pathways. I, I'm hoping after seven sessions, everyone remembers the four pathways pretty well. Um, we can, when we get into the exercise, we have it there for you, so you won't be struggling. Um, but we want you to think about then an intervention that would help you to achieve this statement. So any intervention, it can be any intervention and it can fit in any of the four pathways. So we want you to come up with like have a sheet of paper next to you right now, and just think of an intervention that would help us get at this. 
It could be about law enforcement. It could be about benefits to the communities. It could be about reducing conflict with, with wildlife. It could be something about a totally different livelihood and that is not related to any of the wildlife or any nature-based um, livelihood that you think would help us to direct towards making all use of wildlife sustainable. So write that statement down of what your intervention is gonna be, what action will you take? But then there's another important thing we want you to do, and we're gonna give you a few minutes to do this. We want you to articulate the assumption associated with that intervention. And we've spoken to you a lot about assumptions. Assumptions really mean what is going to be needed for that intervention to be successful. And we'll, we'll be giving you some examples, but we just want you to take some time to think about it. So when you say, well, I think we should have strengthened, um, strengthened law enforcement effort by, by the state agency. We need more rangers. So let's hire more rangers. The assumption you're making is that if you have more rangers, they will in turn help you to reduce unsustainable or illegal use of wildlife. So you're making an assumption about that action that you've decided to take. If you didn't have that assumption, then you wouldn't be proposing that action. So the assumption has to be true in order for this thing to work, this intervention that you're making. And it's complicated to think about these things, but we want you to just take a minute. So you can think about pathway A, B, C, or D. You can think of any action you think is important to take. And before we bring you into the board, we're going to then say to you, okay, but what assumption is going to be needed? So you need to write these things down on a piece of paper because you're going to be sharing those with us. And you don't need to worry about getting the wording all right or having it all perfect. It's just for us to see how we begin to do this. And again, you'll see I've emphasized here that we need everyone to participate. So IUCN colleagues, um, we want you guys all in here. Uh, colleagues from SAWAC, we want you all in here and all our wonderful other participants that are here we would like you to also join in this exercise with us. So is everyone now with us on this board? I hope so, because we've summoned all of you to be here on this board. And I know that all of you are getting anxious about how you want to interact with Mural and that's great. So what we're going to do is we're going to have you, and I would like um, Elna to simmer down for a minute. Um, we have, our interventions and we have our assumption card. So your action, your intervention, you're going to be typing in for us on one of the green cards. Just hang on, whoever's typing, just hang on. And your assumption, you're going to type on a black card. Now I'm just gonna take you quickly to show you what we're going to be doing together. And you don't need to worry about this just yet, but I want to just give you an example of what we're going to be doing. So ultimately, where we're going to have you is we're going to be having you bring your intervention and your assumption onto this board. And this board has on it um, pathway A, pathway B, pathway C, and pathway D. So you can find absolutely everything that we've talked about is on here and your own intervention or action may be on any of those. We're going to let you choose where to put it. And we hope that it's gonna be chaos for a few minutes, 10 minutes probably, but you're going to now go back up here and I'm gonna summon you back and you are going to just be, so we have to we see, I'm not sure what people are doing there, but um, keep so everybody, think, oh, we got yeah, somebody I, is, yeah. Whoever's, I think somebody's just changing the, the size of the card. Try and resist the, the urge yeah, to do and, that. Yeah, try and resist uh, the urge to do that. We can make them a bit bigger for you. 
but don't you change the size of the cards, please. I'm going to actually have to resize that card, I think, if we can. Yeah. Um, so um, just pick a pick a pair. Pick, pick um, a pair. So anyone can start typing on any of these. The minute you start typing, it will belong to you. So you then will take your, your activity, you type it into the green one, type in your assumption on the black one, and then you will move them down to this canvas, which is just below. So you'll find it just below. And then you put your own activity. You'll see I made one here, provide information to communities. I'm gonna summon you again provide information to communities regarding species in legal versus illegal trade and associated penalties. And my assumption was that if communities understand the penalties, it will dis dissuade them from being involved in excessive or illegal use. On pathway B, I put one in, regulated collection of thatching grass in the park. And my assumption was that if communities gain access to free thatching grass from the park, it will incentivize them to help manage other resources sustainably. And on pathway C, I put in one saying, allow communities to eat the meat of animals killed on problem animal control. And my assumption was that if communities gain a benefit, in addition to the removal of a problem animal, they will have less antagonism towards the wildlife. And then lastly, I put one in here in pathway D, make microfinance available to women in the community for self-owned and run businesses. And my assumption was that if women can build small enterprises, they will generate enough income to discourage unsustainable use of na the natural resources they depend on. So again, you see that you're gonna be up here creating, and then we're just going to let you go from there to the, to the one immediately below and you'll be able to see where you are. You take your intervention and assumption and you move it to one of these pathways. So we might have to be giving you some guidance. It's gonna be a mess, we know that. We hope that it's gonna be fun. But what we would ask you is, please just type in to the, to the box in exactly what's there. Don't change the size of it, please, because it really messes up the canvas. So please just type it in there start wherever you want to. IUCN crew, everybody jump in there. Uh, Diane and I will just be watching and helping and trying to clean things up as it goes. And we'll um, be doing that and then come back together to look at the boards um, in a few minutes from now. So everyone can get going now, putting in your intervention and your assumption. And if you have any questions, Again, don't forget that you can go to the button that's right here, and I'll show you where that button is again. Go to the button that Diane is pointing at and I'm pointing at and push on that button if you have any questions and it will take you off to another place where you can place your questions or your comments. So off you go. We're going to let everybody take a, take a crack at this. The black ones, don't forget, the black ones are your assumptions and the green ones are your action. So don't get them mixed up because we have to keep them separate as you saw down below on the canvas that you're moving to. Down here, you're going to be putting, taking your green one and put your green one under my green one and you're gonna take your black one and put your black one under my black one. And don't forget, you can take any green one and you can take any black one. You have pairs there of a green and a black and th that's your pair, but you can take them from anywhere on the, on, on the board. I see people are getting at it. Don't forget though, you have to do an assumption. So before you leave to move your green one, don't forget to write your assumption.
Okay, let's get more people active on this. You've been seven sessions with us. So hopefully you have some ideas on how to make um, all use sustainable because this is your day-to-day -day work. We can see that there are some that are that are going for it. If you have more than one intervention, yeah, feel free. Feel free, but make sure that each intervention has an associated assumption. So each green card needs a black card. This is just like being in a workshop with post-it notes and cardboard on the on the side of the the wall. Yep, please don't move them without an assumption because they don't really mean anything to us without their assumptions. Okay, I see a good one there. Community access to resources from protected areas. So I assume that means give communities access to resource from protected areas and that it will increase their sense of ownership. So that one now needs to be moved to the board below into the into the pathway where you think it fits yeah down here we see that some have already been added down here but now we have one action that doesn't have an assumption with it and we have one assumption that doesn't have an action with it so whoever's done these ones please make sure Diane, I think you and I are going to have to do some more assumption training. Yep, that's okay. We'll just, we'll brainstorm some assumptions, but give yep. it a go, everyone. There's no wrong answer here. You're all practitioners. So it's just a matter of articulating what's already in your mind. Right. So this one right here, empowering communities living around the parks financially. Whoever did that, please move it to the board below and the pathway you think it belongs in. Don't forget that if you're, you're struggling, you can always go down to the right-hand corner and zoom out, if that'll make it easier for you to drag things across. Zoom in and out. Oh, Michael's got it, great. Okay, somehow one, I see Diane, one got copied as opposed to moved. So it got, uh, sorry, it got moved and copied. Okay. Um, people struggling a bit with this, I can see. But let's see, let's give it some time because I think everybody who's been on this with us will know about how to do these things and how to take an, take an action. You're all practitioners on here, so we know that you know about action. Yep, James, I see that's a nice assumption. Let's get your, let's get your action in there. Seeing what's going on up on the upper board. James, just put your action to the left of your assumption. So Holly, can you unsummon us? Cause I think it's like, I don't know if you can do that, but um, each time I try to move, it's like pulling me back to where you are. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure you can. I think can you move, can you move now? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure who did support both illegal and legal wildlife activities as part of sustaining livelihoods, but could you please put that together with an assumption? And if your assumption is one of the ones on the left, please put it over there to the left. I don't know if these go together, Diane, I can't tell under pathway B. Um, I think they might, certainly these two might. So should we move that one there? Yeah. I don't think those two mix. Let 
Yeah, that's great. That's a good one. Oh, that's a nice one. Michael, I saw yours come down and then it disappeared again. I think it's being moved. Okay. So we don't have anyone putting anything in pathway A yet. And I don't see anything in pathway C. Everything's going into pathway B, which is very interesting in its own right. Uh, and we have something going into pathway D. So let's give this Diane, let's see, it's half past. Um, I think we're okay. I think we're good. So we're gonna just give this a little bit more time. Uh, Michael, when it moves, it keeps disappearing. Any idea what I'm doing wrong? Um, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure either. It disappears. Okay. Um, okay, let me just see whether I can okay, move it's, that. Yeah, it's there. I can see it. If you can move it, Holly, that would Di be great. Um, where, where do you want it to be put under C? I think that's where it looked like he was trying to put, yeah, I, ah, I see what yes. happened. I see what happened. Um, there's another one there. Okay, there are some that are coming in on the chat in Zoom. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put those in for people. Okay. Um, um, Michael, I saw yours floating around again. Can you just leave it somewhere and I'll try and pick it up? Okay. Michael, I'm not sure what you did. Somehow you seem to have locked something accidentally because I just tried to move it and I also couldn't, it disappeared. Um, Michael, another suggestion is just use the one that's up there on the board under C, on pathway C. Yeah, where Diane is pointing, just use that one. You seem to have locked your, your thing. I can't tell why that happened. Okay. Sorry, that's me. I'm just gonna get rid of it. What are you getting rid of, Diane? Sorry, no, don't worry about it. It's just okay. about to happen. Okay. Okay, so this one can now come down. Okay, I'm just trying to capture the ones from the chat. Yep, good, well done. I, if you plunk them in, I'll get them lined up, Diane. Okay, uh, oh, I've got, okay, I've got one now. So let's just get- Just want to see if there's anything that's left up. Bad practices in poaching has not been moved. Um, and I'm not sure what it means, but I'm going to put it under I'm gonna put it in pathway here. I've just added two on the bottom row of the section. The section. A bottom row of the, the various interventions assumptions. Okay. So you can decide where they go. Okay, going back up here, any of them that need to be moved down? Yep, so, um, all right, so I'll put these. So this is pathway D, I'll move them. Somehow, Diane, yours and mine are crossing each other up, so I'm gonna stay out of the movement right now, except inside. Oof, we got one that got a little out of size there. Oh, wow. Um, I got to move this out of the way. Okay. 
because it needs to be gosh there's some great ones here okay whoever had that really big one um i just moved it aside for a moment and please feel free to start typing i just had to resize it to get it in the Mary, okay. I'm capturing. I'm capturing yours, Mary. If you can let me know what your assumption is. So, Diane, do you know whether we have everything from the upper board yet? Okay. So, from the upper board, we. Uh, okay, hang on. I'm, I'll just move some down. I'm, I'm moving on your behalf, uh, whoever did develop and run community owned and managed tourism businesses into pathway B. Please let us know if it, that's I'm, not the case. I'm cleaning as we go. I still don't have a so I have some that don't have um, assumptions. Shall I move them anyway? Yeah, just move them down. Um, there's some above, Diane. Do you want to move those or should I get up there and get them? Promote use of indigenous knowledge and traditional stories and conservation. Absolutely. But goodness, where is that one going to go? I would imagine it will go under um, some. Uh, well, it could go under A, I think. Okay. Right. Although it could go under B, mm, not sure. Yep, so that's a good question. Okay, I've got development community enterprise projects, but I don't have an assumption yet. That one is from Mary. Ah, there you go, I've got the assumption. So I will just quickly make an assumption and bring that down. I'm just putting some notes so that we look at things. Um, this one, if anybody can look at, pa at pathway B, whoever put in community should perceive tangible and intangible benefits from both. Um, I'm not sure which one goes with it. I actually think, Diane, I'm gonna move that one down. Um, and then you, people can tell us if it's wrong. Okay. Okay, let's put this one in. Okay, this is looking really good. Please feel free to keep moving things in if you need to. Okay, we seem to have something in each of our pathways. Okay, I've got one more from the chat and then I think we should probably We can all ask where we think that's going to be. So Diane, have you checked also the upper board? Yep, I'm checking that. Someone's writing a new one, so. Okay. That's getting pretty cleaned up now. So I'm going to, Diane, are we ready for, I see there's a. Yeah. We have one in pathway A where there's an assumption, but not an action. Okay, so that should actually be black. So I'm just going to move it across. It's black. Oh, oh, you've changed another one. Okay. In pathway A, I've just got a, a lone assumption. Yeah, and I've got a lone assumption in pathway B. Okay. I mean, I think these, it's fine. We'll yeah, just yeah, it's talk no big about deal. that's fine. It's okay, so I think. I've captured summon. everything 
from the chat and I've captured everything from the upper board. So I think now, because we're going to run out of time. Yeah. We're um, just gonna we've quickly. got, sorry. Yeah. Just to quickly run through. So I was going to yeah, summon so, everyone. Absolutely. So everyone stop doing your, um, your thing. Although I could see people were getting into it um, and maybe just hands off and follow Holly so we can have a discussion now. Okay, so um, I don't know, Diane, do you want to work through the first one and I'll do the second one sure. or whichever way? Yeah, so we're it. now in pathway A, which is about, um, let's see what it is, increased costs of unsustainable or illegal wildlife use. So um, I'm just going to summon everyone to make sure you're with me. Um, provide, so we've got an action, provide information to, that was Holly's one, so we don't need to go over that. Yeah. Um, then we've got another one, which is increased application of penalties for illegal use by local authorities. Okay, um, that's the action. And then there would the assumption is that there would be sufficient capacity or desire within local authorities to undertake greater monitoring or prosecutions. Great. I mean, I think that that's yep. right. That's that's pretty perfect. Yep. And then we have one that was put in here as an assumption, which is poaching is hard to regulate due to law enforcement susceptibility to bribery. So that is, I think we would all agree a very true statement. Um, what you would probably want to do is, is the way that you would assumption that you would phrase that is in order for an action on anti-poaching to be effective, your assumption is that poaching is well-regulated um, and that bribery is not a problem. So that's just how you start to think about assumptions is that what are the statements that have to hold true in order for your action to have effect? Right. And, you know, because there isn't an action that's been given on this one, it's very, that is an important assumption. And it'd be very interesting to see if you were developing a project, what kind of activity could you begin to take then if mm -hmm. you wanted to try and, and reduce that susceptibility to bribery? So you may think about what you want to do there. For example, uh, if you increase the penalties that someone might think, oh, I better not get involved in it. And so you would, your action would be to increase penalties. Um, there could be make, make uh, initial offenders will have mandatory jail sentences. Things like that would probably begin to bring that more under control. Yep. So, in the, for the sake of time, shall I move on to the next Yes, board? I think so. We've, we're getting tight on time. Yeah. So we'll just go through a couple of these because it's really just for people to be able to see what we're doing. So one of you said to on this one is, as you will remember, it's about increasing the in incentives for stewardship. So one of you said, well, community to reach agreement on how sustainability will be managed and monitored. So you'll be doing some kind of activity around that. And your assumption is that the communities, of course, will have the rights to benefit and manage the wildlife, which is absolutely key. So that's a really good pairing. If we look at the next one here, improve community access to non-consumptive tourism value chain. And your assumption is that increasing the benefits from the presence of wildlife in the area will reduce the desire to exploit it. Um, These are really good. They're, they're quite fun. So then support both illegal and legal acti wildlife activities as part of sustaining livelihoods. Your assumption is that communities should perceive tangible and intangible benefits from both. So that's, that's a really interesting one because it's- I, I, think, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's good, right? So that's basically saying if, you're, if your objective is sustainability, then even illegal activity, um, as long as it's sustainable, should right. be encouraged. Right. So that's a tricky one to think about because it requires some reverse logic thinking about allowing something that doesn't have a law allowing it, but it may still be sustainable. Um, then this one, disseminate inspiring stories of communities enjoying the benefit of wildlife. Um, if community, uh, that's the action. If communities access inspiring stories on the value of wildlife, it will motivate stewardship. That's a really interesting assumption. So you want to really challenge yourself. Like, why do you think that? And do you know, you know, what are the reasons behind that kind of assumption? Because you wouldn't ever want to take this activity unless you believed that this assumption will lead you to that, to, to the, the impact that you want to have. So yeah. these are all excellent. 
develop and run community owned managed tourism businesses. Uh, that's the action and increase household economy through legal use reduces need for illegal practices. Cool. Great. That's great. I think we should move on to the next yeah. one. Holly. Okay. So we're just giving some examples. Um, we'll bring you over and share one or two from here. Um, let's yeah, see. So there's a great one here, which is develop community cluster farms protected by electric fencing to reduce human wildlife conflict. Um, and the assumption is that community members will actually be willing to move to these plots if they are constructed. So you could have a great plan and get financing for fencing and everything. And then the community says, no, thanks, we'll stay where we are. So it's important to challenge those assumptions. Um, another one is the provision of rainwater harvest uh, tanks or facilities near the park. Um, and the assumption is that this will reduce uh, conflict associated with water collection from the park, as well as um, uh, you know, in, exposure to diseases improving community well-being. Uh, please put mine in the matrix. I failed. I did it. Sorry, but I copied that across as well. So those are okay. a couple from pathway C and then pathway D. Holly, if you want to do that one. Yep. Just really quickly, because we're, we're really late on time today. We knew this would happen, that we would get a little bit late. So some of you might end up staying a few minutes after. Um, so make microfinance, that was the one I put, empowering the communities living around the fi parks financially. Mm -hmm. This can be achieved by park authorities by equally sharing resources obtained from parks. So those in a way are two activities. Um, I think it's really important for people to see that th this one on the right, this, this needs to be reworded as an assumption. That would be that if you gave them that, that ability to share, they would then um, they would then uh, help with that keeping you sustainable. But this yeah. one again is about resources. So we would not put this in this place yeah. because this is about park resources. And yet this pathway is about things that are directly not wildlife based. So we would actually put that in pathway B. Um, improved rangeland management. Far farmers are willing to work together and invest more time and manpower to improve management. So yeah, cool. So I think this has given you um, really quickly, we can figure out a way to tidy this and, and provide it to you. So you all have this as a takeaway um, from, our, from our session here. But this was really just to give you guys an idea of how do you start? Where do you start? You have an impact statement at the top, which we've all seen this impact statement. And then you're gonna have that, and then you're gonna to work towards all of this, starting at the very bottom with your activities, working your way up through that to your outcomes, and then eventually hoping that you can achieve your impact. So I'm gonna break from here now, and we're all gonna go back to the Zoom. I will share my screen because we are running a bit late, but let me get into the PowerPoint. So let's get everybody back on Zoom with us. So basically that's just been our attempt to let you see and begin to play with the other uses of, of, of the flood methodology. We, we actually, the more and more we play with it and the more and more we talk to people, the more and more useful we do think it is. But we wanna take an opportunity now just to give the floor to Leo to talk a bit about what next for flood. And he's just gonna give us a few comments on that. So Leo um, from IUCN Asaro, who's been leading this project, please Leo, the floor is yours. Thanks Holly, um, good morning everybody. Um, yeah, we just thought as we are um, winding down this online um, learning event, um, it'll be good to talk a little bit about uh, what's next for flood. So um, these online learnings we've been doing over the past several weeks have really been part of our uh, efforts at um, awareness raising about the flood methodology and, um, and further training capacity building so that this, this, um, this methodology can be used as widely as possible. And that's really important here because um, what we ultimately want is that this methodology, which we know is useful. We, we've heard a lot about examples of how um, using this can really bring out some very positive 
um, outcomes. It can help change interventions. It has potential to design better interventions. So we got the proof of concept, um, but this methodology has been so far used in a rel you know, relatively few sites, uh, few geographical areas by a very few pool of individuals, most of whom are on this call. So what we really want to do is, um, is we want to go, um, uh, we want to take flood to scale basically. And, and how do we do that? So that's really um, what we're going to be focusing our attention on um, in, in the coming months and years. And Holly, maybe you can go to the previous um, slide. So um, yeah, so, so we mentioned this before and, and many of you already know about this and have probably taken a look at it. So we, we did develop a, a, a guidance document early on, um, which does describe the methodology, et cetera. But as we've said many times before, to actually be trained in this pretty complicated uh, methodology, you, you need more. So we've been working with the Southern Africa Wildlife College, who are also on this call and be participating with us to develop more detailed guidance. Um, so an implementation guide that builds on, on what we have already, but also a facilitation guide to help um, others train uh, flood and how do you actually facilitate the process, et cetera, et cetera. So we are now going to be focusing on finalizing this. And this online um, learning event has been extremely useful in a number of ways. And we, we've learned just from, from teaching this online, which was not the original idea, we've, we've learned things and we've learned um, what they emphasize and some, some tricks of, of how to train this. So that will benefit us now as we move towards finalizing the implementation guide and, and facilitation guide with the Southern Africa Wildlife College. And also we do want to use, um, all these sessions have been recorded and, and you know, they, they, they will be used again uh, for others to benefit from. And, and also given the COVID times, you know, the, the traditional uh, training uh, sort of workshops where a lot of people come together and, and you know, get trained over several uh, period of, uh, you know, days is not really possible at the moment. Uh, we realize that just doing flood online uh, is not adequate either. So we need to kind of figure out how to best um, have a blend and how do we, how do, how do, we do this effectively. Um, so we will be looking at that, but the aim is to have this comprehensive training course done by, um, by middle next year at, at the latest. Um, and we will be piloting that still and probably we'll have some online uh, pilot, maybe even physical if it's possible, uh, training workshops um, uh, on that. So, so stay tuned because we will be informing you of, of how that goes. Um, okay, then uh, Holly, maybe on to the next slide. Yeah, but then, you know, as I said, you know, obviously we, we, we want to get this methodology out there. We want others to take it, use it, um, so that we're not so dependent on a couple of people who've, who've uh, used the methodology before. So, so training of trainers is very important. And I know we asked already in one of the previous events if there was interest in, in being um, a trainer in flood, and, and then there was some positive feedback. So, we will be following up on that and others who, who would like to be trained. You know, people who've been following this course, for example, have a good foundation, but we'd like to go into more in-depth training of trainers. And in that way, hopefully there'll be a snowball effect and many other people could be trained um, across the region. So that's the idea. So that's certainly something we're going to be looking at and how we do that exactly and when, not yet sure, we're going to discuss that, but that's definitely the plan to make flood more sustainable. We would also like to institutionalize it if we can into some of the relevant training institutions in the region. So Mweka Wildlife College, for example, and Makerere in Uganda, they've already expressed an interest and they've been participating on and off in this online series. So these are regional institutions. So we want to explore with them, how could this fit into their curricula? Can we custom design something for flood so that many other people after projects such as Connect and Biopama End so in East Africa and, and Southern Africa, there'll be institutions that would be able to actually train people, um, uh, relevant you know, managers and practitioners to use this methodology. So that we're gonna be exploring that. We don't know exactly how it's gonna work and whether you know, institutions uh, would welcome this and, and could it fit in. And also we'd be interested to hear, and maybe that's something that um, we'll be asking uh, you about also in the SurveyMonkey um, questionnaire that's gonna be coming and Lib will explain that a bit later, is that there might also be some national level um, institutions that might be interested in this. I mean, KWS has training institutions. I'm sure Uganda Wildlife Authority, Rwanda Development Board, Tanzania uh, uh, Protected Area Authorities too. So maybe that's even national level institutions. So that's something we're gonna be exploring and we're going to be having discussions with those sorts of institutions. 
And then finally, obviously, we want to see actual on the ground action. Um, and it's been very encouraging to hear already in, in some of the previous sessions that there's been interest and, and specific sites and landscapes have been even named where, where people feel that flood could really be, you know, could add value and could be rolled out. So obviously we want to stay involved and to support that in any way we can. Now, having said that, of course, it does require resources. So that may mean if there are no existing resources available, we might fundraise, need to fundraise, maybe jointly fundraise um, to do, to do a flood rollout on the ground. And obviously we are very interested in hearing the lessons that come out of that flood rollout. Because remember, what we're trying to do here is to, is to also uh, influence policy and practice going forward and continue to, in, to, to help uh, develop the, the flood methodology. So that means we would be happy to try to help disseminate the lessons learned. And there is the people in the poaching platform, which is excellent for that as well. So we're very keen on, on, um, on, on supporting the rollout of flood at site level as well. But we will be asking more uh, in the survey monkey question that's coming your way on all these things. So um, you, can, you can provide us feedback if you're interested in these opportunities, whatever other opportunities they are, maybe you know of resources, sites, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, so that's just to give you a flavor of, of, of the future of flood. So this has just been this capacity building element that we've been working on on this online event is just part of a, of a bigger program um, that we would like to, to implement around um, local communities combating illegal wildlife trade. So I know we're a bit short on time, so I will leave it at that and I'll, I'll hand back to, to Holly. Thanks. Okay, thanks, over Leo. To, over to Diane. Yeah, thank, thanks, Leo. That was really helpful. Um, right, we're going to go into our mentee. Um, so Liv is going to take us through the mentee. A reminder that you can either click on the link that is in the... Um, that's in, the, that's in the chat, or you can go to menti.com and enter the code that is in the chat. If you're using your phone or something, you might wanna just do that. And um, once again, I think you've heard this uh, question before, how useful did you find this session with one being not useful and 10 being very useful? Um, and we're gonna hope that we hit our 17, 18, but please do click through the, it is in the chat. Um, we only have a few minutes left. So um, thanks, uh, Janvier. I know that you guys in Rwanda are having some connectivity problems today. Um, just give you a few more. See if we can get a few more people responding. We can count Janvier and Amos in as, a, as very useful. So That's great. Figure that later. <laughs> Remember, everything's anonymous, so we can't see who's who's voting. But these guys from Rwanda are very, very upfront, and they're telling <laughs> us because they can't get in. <laughs> Thanks, guys from Rwanda. You've been absolutely fabulous participants. Thank you for sticking right. with us, even through bad storms and bad connectivity. The rainy season has begun in Zimbabwe, so I'm waiting for storms to get in the way of, of my connectivity, but so far, so good. Okay, so we're up to 13. Yep, just give it a few more seconds. Um, I'm gonna put the code and the link back in the chat. Yep. Kind of, I'm kind of hoping for our magical number of 17. We've got 32 people currently on the call. Yeah, come on, we can get to the lucky 17. There are only 15 of you, two more to go. Oh, Jean Damascene, I'm gonna capture that assumption. Thank you. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, can we okay. get a couple more or <laughs> that's it, Diane? I think we should move on. Um, so now our lucky number is 15. So Liv, can you move on to the next one? Yeah. Okay, and then, so specifically today we were talking about new IWT projects. So how likely are you to use flood for new IWT projects? And you've got four options there of definitely, maybe, probably not, definitely not. <laughs> We, we know and we've, we've been saying, you know, throughout our, throughout our, our series that 
you know, it was never our intent that you could be a brilliant practitioner right off the bat. So we know that some people might feel tentative, um, but trying it is really the way you do it. That's what we've learned over, over our years of involvement in it is just beginning, um, get, gets you a long way. Yeah, Diane, let's at least try and get the magic 15. Okay, I'm just putting the link in again. Um, I lost it because I copied Jean Domacine. Do you need it? No, I've done it. So the link is there again. Um, someone is joined from their iPhone, which is great. So hopefully they will be able to answer now. Thank you. Okay. I think Rwanda, Rwanda looks like. <laughs> yeah, Leah, not... let's, let's get a project going in Rwanda. It seems like it's, it's. Our Rwandese colleagues have been with us through thick and thin, but that's not to say all the others have not been great. We really, really appreciated that. It's motivated okay. Diane and myself every, <laughs> every week to go further because of you. Um, all right, Liv, I think we should go on to the next one. Yeah. And this is about using the flood approach for different types of conservation challenges outside of IWT. Um, and again, the same, um, the same options. And we would really, really love to hear from anyone who does take the plunge um, for either new IWT projects or these types of different conservation challenges. We'd love to hear how it goes. <clears throat> this is great. <clears throat> Okay, brilliant. We're up to 13, which is where we got um, last time. So thank you very much. That's very helpful for us. I will now um, share our last few slides. So, you know, we really please don't hesitate to be in touch. If you've got questions, if you want to share with us how it's going, if you want to work together to raise funds for, for rolling it out, um, there are all of our email addresses. Um, <clears throat> and the two websites. So the guidance materials are all available. All of the videos are available. Um, this one will be uploaded as well as case studies from, from projects that engage communities in combating legal wildlife trade. Um, there's tons of them on people not poaching from, from all over the world, not just East Africa. So please um, don't hesitate, be in touch, let us know uh, how it's going. Um, Liv, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, so um, we've got one final request from you, if that's okay. Um, and we've designed a 15 minute survey, so a short survey on SurveyMonkey, um, to understand both your thoughts on the learning series, how you found it, what we could have done differently, um, and also how you plan to use Flood, if at all, going forward. Um, and it's really, really helpful if you can if you can fill this out for us because it will help us design future flood training sessions. Um, and so I'm going to pop the link into the chat box now, which will take you directly to the survey. Um, and you can also expect to receive an email from me at some stage today, um, possibly this afternoon. So look out for that as well. And that will contain um, the link to the survey as well. And just thank you in advance for all of your responses. It'll be super, super helpful for us. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Liv. So, so that's it. And I will hand over to Leo to do, to do the final, final thanks. But from me and Holly um, and Liv, thank you for being our, um, our partners over the last, uh, oh gosh, few months. It's been great. Yeah. It's been absolutely great. And we just want to say uh, happy 
holidays to everyone and stay safe. And thank you so much for following us for the last few months. So Leo, if you want to close us out. Yeah, thanks very much. So yeah, so really on, on behalf of the IUCN Regional um, Office for Eastern and Southern Africa, thank you um, to everybody. First of all, the participants, um, it's, been, it's been a fantastic uh, series. Uh, I really thank you for your active participation. It's, it's made it uh, more effective and, and, uh, and interesting. Um, and also we've, we've not only done this training uh, for the first time, but uh, we've also benefited really throughout from your feedback and, and, and you really contributed to, to making this, um, this training more effective in the future. So, so really, really thank you very much for that. And I hope you've, you've uh, enjoyed them. And, um, and I'm, I'm sure that um, among uh, you participants, uh, there will be some future uh, flood practitioners and trainers and, and really look forward to working with you uh, going forward. Um, then I would, I would really, really like to thank our partners, IID and Suli, and in particular, um, Liv, Holly, Diane, who worked so incredibly hard on, on putting these, these, um, these events together on the content, excellent facilitation. Uh, it, it is really, really impressive. And, and, and I would really like to thank you for that. Um, thank you to the IUCN uh, team, uh, the contributions from Grace and Caroline and others. And then last but not least, thank you very much to, to our donors, um, USAID Kenya and East Africa, who've been supporting Flood from its very inception, to the European Union, through EU DEFCO, who've, who've supported this work and are continuing to support us through the Biopharma program to, to enable us to continue the, the capacity building and, and support the Flood in the Eastern Southern Africa region. So I thank you very much. Yeah, and then just finally from me as well, just happy holidays to everybody. And let's hope that 2021 uh, shapes out to be a better year for all of us. Thank you very much for now. Thanks, Leo. Thanks, Leo. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for all of your time with us.